Okay, so we're into hematology and we're going to talk about the pharmacology of hematology. So let's start with the alkylating agents. The first one is cyclophosphamide and isophosphamide, or isophamide. Now the mechanism by which these work is they covalently cross-link DNA strands at the guanine N7 and that causes cell death. All right, it's a prodrug, so it's activated in the liver. Now, cells with high levels of aldehyde dehydrogenase, that is important, aldehyde dehydrogenase are protected. So that's going to be your bone marrow stem cells, your liver, and intestinal epithelium. So there's relatively few classic signs of chemotherapy toxicity with this. So when are we going to use this guy? Well, we're going to use it in things like lymphomas, Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, leukemias, every single one of them, ALL, AML, CLL, CML, breast, testicular, and ovarian cancer. So the indications lymphomas, leukemias, breast, testicular, and ovarian cancer. Now, the toxicity you get from cyclophosphamide is hemorrhagic cystitis. Hemorrhagic cystitis. Now, that's due to acrolin, which is a metabolite of cyclophosphamide, so it leads to myelosuppression. Okay, now you can prevent hemorrhagic cystitis with a drug called Mesna. And that pretty much is cyclophosphamide for you in a nutshell. So let's talk about the nitrosureas. This is carmustine, lomustine, semustine, and streptozosin. All right, what these do is they alkylate DNA. They alkylate DNA, and the main indication for these guys is brain tumors. So like glioblasta multiforme, so it's lip, you know it's lipophilic, so it crosses the brain barrier. And also you, also you can use these in Hodgkin's lymphoma. All right, now the toxicity of these guys leads to myelosuppression. Leukopenia. And dizziness and ataxia. So what about cisplatinum? Well, platinum complexes and binds and crosslinks DNA, which causes apoptosis. The indications for cisplatinin include bladder, testicular, and ovarian cancer. Um, the toxicity of this guy includes anaphylaxis. Ototoxic, 
Can you think of another drug that's ototoxic? That's right, your loop diuretic, so you can get tetanus and deafness. Also, renal toxicity. And peripheral neuropathies. So what about busulfan? What do we know about this guy? Well, his mechanism is a DNA alkylation of the guanine in 7. Now, what other drug have we talked about so far that also does the same thing? That's right, cyclophosphamide. Um, so you compare it to cyclophosphamide. This guy's indications is in CML. Um, the toxicity includes pulmonary fibrosis. And um, dysplasia. They call that busulfan lung. Um, severe bone marrow suppression. Um, it's potent against hemopoietic stem cells, so that's why you see all the things you do with those. So those are your alkylating, alkylating agents used in hematology. So let's talk about your antiplatelet drugs. Aspirin is a non-selectively inhibit, inhibitor of COX-1 and COX-2 by acetylation of serine residues. Now, there's a ton to talk about about aspirin, so I'm not going to write it all in here for you. But what that does with the serine residues is arachidonic acid cannot be converted to prostaglandin H2, the precursor of thromboxane H2. That is important to know. Okay, Arachidonic acid cannot be converted to prostaglandin H2, which is a precursor to thromboxane A2. So note. Aspen is an irreversible inhibitor of COX, whereas other NSAIDs are reversible inhibitors. So what are you going to see with that? You're going to see an increased bleeding time. The PTT and the PT are unaffected. Now the toxicities include bleeding, gastric ulcers, Rye syndrome, um, etc. You can also get aspirin-induced asthma, which arises from an imbalance of arachidonic acid product synthesis. Since aspirin is a non-selective COX inhibitor, synthesis of thromboxanes, prostacyclins, and prostaglandins are inhibited from arachidonic acid. However, leukotriene synthesis is unimpeded because there is no inhibition of 5-lipooxygenase. Let's write that in there. So leukotrienes can prevent per preferentially accumulate. So pre people with predisposed sensitivity develop bronchospasm and asthma, and that's how you get aspirin-induced asthma. Note, this is not, this is not, I repeat, this is not an IgE type 1 hypersensitivity mediated event. Aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease, or AERD, um, which is chronic rhinosinusitis, nasal polyps, and asthma. Ingestion of aspirin and NSAIDs precipitates asthma and rhinitis attacks. 
However, the infl inflammatory process begins and continues even without exposure to NSAIDs and aspirin. Once it develops, it remains for life. So that's aspirin in a nutshell for you. I know that's a lot, but the main things I think we hit on. So let's talk about clopidogrel and ticlopidine. This irreversibly binds ADP receptors. And what that does, that's going to lead to the prevention of the GP2B3A activation. And that's going to lead to decreased platelet aggregation. So the indications in, in clopidogrel and ticlopidine include coronary stents, uh, thrombotic stroke, antiplatelet therapy in post-stroke and post-TIA patients. A recent study found that adding clopidogrel to aspirin in patients who already suffered a stroke or transient ischemic attack reduces the chance of further cerebrovascular events compared to aspirin alone. So the toxicity of ticlopidine, you need to know, is neutropenia. All right, so what about excizumab? Excizumab is a monoclonal antibody that targets the glycoprotein 2B3A. So what's that mean? That's going to lead to a decreased platelet aggregation. So the indications in this guy include angioplasty, and acute coronary spasms, or acute coronary syndrome, sorry. And there you go, there's your antiplatelet agents. So now what are we going to talk about? Breast cancer agents. So the most famous is tamoxifen, but you also have riloxifene. Now the mechanism by which these work is a competitive binding to estrogen receptors, which do what? Decrease DNA synthesis. All right, so these are called SERMs, selective estrogen receptor modulators. They're indicated in breast cancer, as I said, breast cancer agent. Um, they can be used to prevent osteoporosis. Um, there's a possible increased risk of endometrial cancer, but that's with tamoxifen only. So you need to know that. All right, let's talk about uh, the toxicity also. I'm sorry, the toxicity also includes flushing. So what about tri trastuzumab? This is obviously, by the name, a monoclonal antibody against the HER2, which HER2 stands for Human Epidermal Growth Factor Receptor 2. So it activates antibody-dependent cellular toxicity. Um, toxicity includes a cardiomyopathy. Um, left ventricular ejection fraction can be down. 
severe heart failure. Um, and severe pulmonary toxicity. And that is the toxicity for trastuzumab. What about anastrozole? This is a reversible competitive inhibitor of aromatase. Now, aromatase is an enzyme that converts androgens to estrogen. It's used in postmenopausal women with breast cancer. And the last one on the list, exmustane. This is an oral steroidal aromatase inhibitor used in the adjuvant treatment of estrogen receptor positive breast cancer in postmenopausal women. All right, so that is the breast cancer agents. Now let's talk about the DNA intercalating agents. Okay, so dactinomycin or actinomycin D. The mechanism by which this works is it intercalates between guanine and cytosine. So what does that mean? Well, it inhibits DNA and RNA synthesis. Indications for this guy include rhabdomyosarcoma, Wilms tumor, Ewing sarcoma, and testicular tumors. And the toxicity includes myelosuppression. So now let's talk about free radical induction agents. Bleomycin has a presumed mechanism that it chelates metal ions and produces superoxide and hydroxide free radicals that cleave DNA. The indications for this guy include lymphoma, Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's, testicular cancers, melanoma, and squamous cell carcinoma. Um, it is less myelosuppressive regimen for Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now the toxicities include pulmonary 
fibrosis. So what about doxyrubicin or adromycin and danorubicin? Well, the mechanism by which these work is they intercalation between DNA base pairs, which leads to a decreased DNA and RNA synthesis. Also inhibits DNA topoisomerase 2. Now, um, the mechanism also it, it also chelates iron, producing free radicals that cleave DNA. So you can compare that to what other drug? Leomycin. Now, the indications part of the ABVD are, or in other words, adromycin, bleomycin, vinblastine, and uh, dicarbazine. It's also used in breast, ovarian, lung carcinoma, and sarcomas. Now, the toxicity of uh, doxyrubicin is that it is cardiotoxic. That is important. But it's dose dependent. And you also get a myelosuppression. And alopecia. All right, so those are your free radical induction agents. So what about the G2 phase agents? Well, the G2 phase follows the S phase, which prepares the cell for mitosis. So etopside is the drug we're going to talk about because it causes cell death during the late S phase and G2 phase. So the mechanism is inhibition of topoisomerase 2, which induces DNA breaks. It's activated by dephosphorylations. Now, when, when is this indicated? In solid cancers. lymphomas, and leukemias. Now the toxicities include, as you might expect, myelosuppression and alopecia. And that is the top side for you. So now let's talk about the fun old heparins. Now, there's a ton of information here, so I'm going to be reading a lot more than I'm writing. So, let's talk about the mechanism. It catalyzes the reaction between antithrombin-3 and the serine protease clotting factors. So, we always need to know the mechanism of action. So it inactivates thrombin and factor 10A.
as well as factors 7, 9, 11, and 12. So it's given intravenously or subcutaneously. The time of onset, if given intravenously, is a uh, median, and if it's subcutaneous, it's about 30 minutes. The half-life of the drug is one to two hours. So when is it indicated for immediate anticoagulation, such as a DVT, such as a MI, a PE, or a stroke? That's when we use heparin. Heparin does not cross the placenta, thus is safer than warfarin in pregnancy. Um, you dose by the PTT. That is important. Not the PT, but the PTT. Um, the goal range is 50 to 80, um, depending on the scenario. Bleeding can occur if patients are given too much heparin. So reversible... How do you reverse heparin? You do it with a drug. As soon as this thing cooperates with me, I'll tell you. You do it with a drug called protamine sulfate. That's how you reverse heparin. All right, so then we get into heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, or HIT. Now, there's two types of this. There's a type 1 and a type 2. So type 1 is a non-immune disorder. Where you get where heparin activates platelets. Heparin induced thrombocytopenia can be a severe and life threatening complication of heparin therapy. Now, type 1 usually presents within one to two days of exposure and, dissolve, and resolves with discontinuation. But now, type 2 is a little different. Type 2 is an immune-mediated immune-mediated reaction caused by antibodies against heparin PF4 complex, which is platelet factor 4. Heparin PF4, platelet factor 4 complex. So antibodies which recognize the platelet heparin platelet factor 4 complex bind to the surface of platelets and induce their activation. The cross-linking of IgG on platelets induces a thrombocytopenia and a hypercoagulable state. So that is why that is so important. So patients generally present with five, within five to 14 days following heparin treatment with type two with signs and symptoms of thrombocytopenia and arterial or venous thrombosis. So how do you treat this? You treat it with fondaparinix, which is a selective 10A inhibitor.
and also can treat it with Liperidone, Luperidin, which is a direct thrombin inhibitor. You can also treat it with Agatroban or Warfarin. Now, a random fact, the highest negative charge density of any known biological molecule is heparin. So protamine sulfate, therefore, is positively charged, and that's why we can use that. So let's talk about enoxaparin. Spelled that wrong. What is special about anoxaparin? Well, it's a low molecular weight heparin. It's the same mechanism, so it preferentially inhibits 10A and 2A. Um, so you can remember that by anoxaparin with the X and the A, 10A. It's got a better bio, bioavailability and a longer half-life, but low molecular weight heparin is given subcutaneously. It is used in DVT prophylaxis. And in, and in the treatment of established venous thrombosis while bridging with warfarin. There's no monitoring needed. It doesn't raise the PT, the PTT, or the INR. It is not easily reversible, though. That is the only downside to low molecular weight heparin. So now let's talk about imantinib or Gleevec. So the mechanism by which this works, it inhibits the BCR, ABL, tyrosine kinase. Remember, tyrosine kinase is always involved in growth. So it blocks proliferation and induces apoptosis. Indications for this is in CML with the Philadelphia chromosome. Also in GI stromal tumors or GISTs. Now the toxicity of this guy includes bone marrow suppression and fluid retention. So what about prednisone? What do we know about it? Well, prednisone is a corticosteroid. Its mechanism in tumors is it triggers apoptosis. You starting to see a theme here with this apoptosis? Its indications are an ALL, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, Hodgkin's lymphoma, and a board favorite, multiple myeloma. Most people don't know you can treat multiple myeloma with prednisone. So what about the toxicity? That's what we really got to talk about here. Toxicity includes immunosuppression. Hypertension. Cushing-like syndrome, hypoxemia, 
hyperglycemia. Steroid related psychosis. Osteoporosis. Cataracts. Acne. And last, peptic ulcers. So as you can see, there's quite a few problems with prednisone, but we can use it to treat ALL. That's the only leukemia we can use it for. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, Hodgkin's lymphoma, and multiple myeloma. So definitely know that. And if there's two that I would know, it would be the multiple myeloma and the ALL. And also remember you're immunosuppressed. But also, because it causes hyperglycemia, it can cause you to be a diabetic. All right. So now let's talk about the S phase agents. So what is the S phase? Well, that's where DNA replication occurs. So let's talk about methotrexate. This is a folic acid analog. It irreversibly binds to dihydrofolate reductase, which synthesizes tetrahydrofolate. So tetrahyd what, what's important about that? Tetrahydrofolate is needed for thymidine and purine synthesis. So if you don't have thymidine, you can't have purine synthesis. So its indications are included in RA, rheumatoid arthritis, um, abortion, ectopic pregnancy, psoriasis, neoplasms, and leukemias and lymphomas, which would be neoplasms. Now the toxicity of methotrexate includes myelosuppression, as might be expected, leukopenia, steatosis, Mucositis. Now, how do you, uh, what do you do to give a rescue if you overdose somebody on methotrexate? It's called a leucovorn rescue. You will be tested on this, I guarantee you. Leucovorn rescue, which is nothing more than folinic. acid. So that is methotrexate for you. So now let's talk about 5-4-year. So 5-4-year cell is related to methotrexate, only it is a pyrimidine analog. And therefore you get thymidylate synthase inhibition. Therefore, you get a decreased DTMP. Now, the indications for this guy include colorectal cancer, pancreatic cancer, and it's topically used on basal cell carcinoma. Now, what about the toxicity of it? As you might expect, myelosuppression, just with all these other drugs as well. 
and photosensitivity. Um, only if you see a topical use, you will see photosensitivity. So what about sigma captor purine? Sigma captor purine is converted, the mechanism of action of it, it's converted to the active metabolite by H. G P R T A S, which inhibits purine nucleotide synthesis. Now its indications you use six more capture purine in ALL. The toxicities include myelosuppression, intrahepatic cholelithiasis, and focal centralobular necrosis. So besides myelosuppression, you see intrahepatic cholestasis and focal Centralobular necrosis. It's metabolized by xanthine oxidase, so you get an increased risk of six mercaptopurine toxicity in patients taking what drug? That's right, allopurinol, which is a xanthine oxidase inhibitor for chronic gout. So you've got to be really careful with that when given six mercaptopurine. And look at it, it says purine in the name. So that's kind of a giveaway. So what about citrabine? Citrabine's mechanism of action is it is converted to a cytosine analog, which inhibits both DNAP and RNAP, which are polymerases. So it's indicated in AML, ALL, CML, not CLL, and also lymphomas. Toxicities include leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, and megaloblastic anemia. And that is cybridine for you. So what about hydroxyurea? Well, the presumed mechanism of hydroxyurea is it inhibits ribonucleotide reductase. Preventing synthesis of deoxyribonucleotides, also known as DNA, deoxyribonucleotides. So, when is this indicated for? Well, the big one is sickle cell anemia. You will be tested on that. You can also use it in melanoma and refractory CML. The toxicities, as you might expect, include the good old myelosuppression. And that's hydroxyurea for you. So now let's talk about the thrombolytic. These are indicated for an MI and ischemic stroke. Not hemorrhagic stroke, ischemic stroke. They include TPA, urokinase, and streptokinase. 
the mechanism is they activate plasminogen, which leads to lysis of blood cells and restoration of blood flow to ischemic areas. So the PT and the PTT are both going to be increased. Not to a significant degree, but they will. Um, toxicity includes systemic bleeding. Um, how, so how do we reverse this? What drug do we use to reverse these thrombolytics? It's called amino caproic acid. It, combat it competitively binds to plasminogen. Caproic acid is how you reverse thrombolytics. All right, so tubulin binding agents, the taxols like paclitaxol, what do we know about it? Its mechanism is it enhances assembly of tubulin dimers into microtubular polymers, which stabilizes existing. microtubules and inhibits the assembly. So it enhances assembly of tubulin dimers into microtubular polymers, which stabilizes existing microtubules and inhibits disassembly. So if you forget everything, just know that it's used in microtubules. So this interferes with the progression of the cell through mitosis. So you can compare that to greciofolvin. So what's its indications for? Breast cancer and ovarian cancer. Toxicity includes myelosuppression, and neuropathy. Now, the vinca alkaloids, so vincristine and vinblastine, these bind to tubulin. Bind to tubulin. So microtubules cannot polymerize, therefore the mitotic spindle cannot form. This is specific to the M and the S phase. Remember, mitotic spindles cannot form. So when is this indicated in? Wilms tumor, lymphomas, and leukemias. Toxicity with vincristine includes paralytic ileus, um, with vinblastine it includes myelosuppression, which leads to a leukopenia. Granulocytopenia. An intrathecal administration of vinca alkaloids is fatal. Never, ever, ever administer these intrathecally.
So don't forget that. And lastly, let's talk about the good old warfarin. Warfarin's mechanism of action is it inhibits vitamin K dependent gamma carboxylation. of factors 10, 9, 7, and 2. You can remember that by the mnemonic 1972. That's how I remember it. Um, also, protein C and S. And protein S is the cofactor for protein C. Warfarin's inhibition of gamma carboxylase is irreversible. So its effects last 7 to 10 days after stopping therapy. This is similar to aspirin's irreversible acetylation of serine residues. Because of this 7 to 10 day latency, both medications, both medications need to be carefully managed before when? Before surgery, right? We don't want them bleeding to death. So given orally, it's useful for long term outpatient anticoagulation, so there's no shots needed. Its time of onset is usually days and its half-life is one to two days. Um, it works in the extrinsic pathway. And indications for the warfarin include chronic anticoagulation. So like AFib, that's a big one they like to test you on. Um, DVT, PE, and cardiac valve replacements. And it, remember, warfarin is teratogenic, so it crosses the placenta. Never give warfarin to a pregnant woman. And when is the teratogenic period again? Weeks three through eight. So what do we do? We follow. PT or the INR, um, normalized ver which is the normalized version of the PT. So toxicity includes initial paradoxical thrombus, That's why you always give heparin before warfarin. Bleeding and skin tissue necrosis. Um, how do you so how do you reverse warfarin? What do we do if we give too much of it? Well, we give something called fresh frozen plasma, which contains coagulation factors. Fresh frozen plasma and also vitamin, you got it, K. And that wraps up uh, pharmacology for the hematologic sections of the boards.